following interview was conducted with Franklin, at Franklin M. Kleichlin, Professor Emeritus of Nuclear Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, August 11, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Dr. Kleichlin, and thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so let's start. Tell us where and when you were born and your parents in early years. Okay, I was born in Havre, Montana in the year 1933. Okay. And Haver is a uh, small town by Iowa standards, but it's a large town by Montana standards. Located about halfway between Idaho and North Dakota and 30 miles from the Canadian border. Pinpoint. It's way up there. <laughs> <laughs> way up there. Uh, and I was born there and I was, went to grade school, high school there. Tell us a little about, was grade school a small school or, and then tell about high well, school? Well, the, the, uh, the city that I lived in was about six or seven thousand at that time. It hasn't grown that much since then. Sure. So it's a relatively small school. It's one of three grade schools. And we went to a common junior high for seventh and eighth grade. And then high school, I think, had a total of 400. Okay. About, about 400 students. Any clubs that you were in, or what was your studies, and any teachers? That uh, well, I, my favorite teacher probably was Adolph Cleet, who was a math teacher. And I had him for four years. Uh, another favorite teacher was a uh, man by the name of Howard Moon, who uh, taught the uh, taught the uh, machine shop and uh, but uh, drafting, and so I had two years of drafting. But he was also in charge of running the uh, the overhead projector or the uh, spotlight and so forth for all the plays in the auditorium, and so I got drafted into that job for three years. Uh, so you have all these hidden talents. <laughs> but uh, as far as other activities, uh, my sports activities, I was uh, a rifle shooter. I belonged to the rifle team for four years. Uh, during that time, I was state champion for three out of the four. Good. Very and, good. Uh, that went on, and I did that also when I was in college. And, okay. And, uh, well, you, went, you, know, you graduated from Montana State. How did you have to select to go there? Was it? Well, I uh, decided early on I wanted to go into engineering. And, uh, I kind of had my choice. It was either Montana State, or I could do like my cousin did, and go east to Minneapolis and go to the University of Minnesota. Uh, because for us, we were right on the Great Northern Railroad, railroad, and you could go east or west very easily. North and south, north, south was a little bit more difficult. Of course, north you were in Canada right away. But uh, no, I, I've been to Bozeman, where Montana State is located, several times. Well, we used to have the state rifle matches there, and so I got down there for that. My sister had spent one year in Bozeman, so I knew a little bit about it. And uh, it had a, a good engineering program, I thought. Not that I knew much about engineering at that time, but uh, that's what I was required to What was campus to. like? And did you any clubs or organizations? Can you continue with the rifles too? Well, the campus was, uh, we were down about, we were about 2,000 students at that time. That's a nice uh, size. When I visited there and then I went down for high school week and uh, I kind of got interested in the physics part of it because I enjoyed physics in high school. And uh, Montana State had a program in engineering physics. They could not offer a degree in physics because in those days Montana State could offer engineering. But if you want science, physics, you had to go to the University of Montana, which really had a very poor department because they had no re nobody would take the courses. In Montana State where you had an engineering program, they had to teach physics, and so they had a pretty good physics department, and so I ended up going to Montana State. That was, that's the land grant, correct? Yeah, land grant college, yeah. Um, it's, uh, so I ended up majoring in engineering physics, and then uh, but we were all pushed a little bit more to take more math, so I ended up with a major in math and physics. Uh, of course, the minor then in engineering, but we also had to take a lot of chemistry, so by taking one extra chemistry course, I had a minor in chemistry also. You're well versed. <laughs> well, it, it was interesting, because it's sure. later on, it all paid off. That's right, yeah. So. And, and what happened after, after graduation, what came next, after you finished? After Montana State, uh, well, I, my degree in engineering physics, uh, I remember doing a job interview and one of the people saying that a bachelor's degree in physics is like going around half-dressed. 
we needed a graduate degree. So uh, most of us, there are eight of us, I think, are graduating in engineering physics. Uh, four of us went on and got PhDs in physics. Uh, one got an MD. One went back to the farm. Uh, one got a bachelor's degree, with bachelor's degree, went to Los Alamos, spent his career there and did very well. And another one, I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> You'll hear someday, probably, yeah. But anyway, uh, okay, I wanted to go to graduate school. And uh, I was offered a so-called Lockheed Fellowship. Uh, two, two of my roommates, two of my uh, best friends, were also offered fellowships uh, from a different company, but the same thing. And what this really was was kind of an internship where you went to school half-time and worked half-time. Uh, it sounded good except I was afraid they'd push me into electronics, and I was not interested in electronics at that time. I, that was not my strong point. Uh, I decided I wanted to go into nuclear physics, and one of our former graduates from Montana State had been at Iowa State, and he kind of urged us to go to Iowa State, so that's, I applied to Iowa State, and that's where I went. Okay, good. Were, uh, did you, were you married at that time when you were in grad school, or? I got married while I was in grad school. Oh, did you meet your wife there? I met my wife there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is she a student? No. Uh, my second year, well, summer of my second year, my first year, started graduate school at 55. Summer of 56, I met this girl. And there were a group of us that used to get together and eat lunch. And uh, she joined the group. And uh, she had just graduated from Carleton College. And she was working with, as a reference librarian. And so I, at I the met this gal. At Iowa State? At Iowa State, yeah. And uh, this was like in June or July. And we had lunch together then, so we kind of got to know each other a little bit. Sure. And then in, in uh, August, I think it was August late sometime, a group of us decided to go to an Iowa State Fair. <laughs> Like the movie of the state, the and state so fair movie. So we went to Iowa State Fair and we kind of paired up, and I paired up with my wife Jan. And uh, about two years later, I married her. Oh, very good. That's the start in the beginning of the long career yeah. together. <laughs> uh, well, the that? long career is right. And uh, about six days, we'll celebrate our 52nd wedding anniversary. 52nd? Yeah. That's wonderful. Oh. What are you going to give me? Some special plans? No. <laughs> Just an, oh. We've gone through so many of these. <laughs> uh, did you have to serve? Did you ever serve in the military at all? Uh, in Montana State, we had to. Uh, ROTC. ROTC, and almost all of us at that time. This was 1951 when I started, and that was the start of the Korean mm, War. Right. And, in fact, the number of my classmates started world started uh, Montana State. They were pulled out uh, during the fall uh, quarter and get dra got drafted. But my draft board said, okay, as long as I'm in engineering, uh, physics, and science, and so forth, I can stay in school. So we had two years of ROTC. Well, most of us had signed up for four years. I had signed up for four years, but we finished our two years, and they did not, uh, they said they changed their plans and would not guarantee us a commission. And so most of us just dropped out of ROTC sure. at that point. Even though they notified a draft board, it'd be a good idea if they drafted us. So my draft board was lean enough to keep me out. But uh, I really thought that after four years, I'd end up working in one of the national laboratories. But let's say I ended up going to right. graduate school. Okay. Good. Then after, what, then tell us about your career path before you came to Purdue. After you got your PhD. Well, I got my PhD in '62, mm -hmm. uh, which is typical seven-year program for physics. Uh, I did my work in nuclear physics. Which did you I get? You had the fellowship as well. Did you get the fellowship? Uh, the first year was a teaching and fellowship, and then uh, that uh, that point on, uh, at Iowa State you had the Ames Laboratory, sure. which was an AEC laboratory. Where the former head of uh, materials science was out there, in Ames. Okay, yeah. yeah. But anyway, Alex you had King. the Ames Lab, and uh, all kinds of stories about that. But uh, anyway, they had the synchrotron, and I worked with the synchrotron group. Then. And so uh, that's uh, finished my PhD in '62. I uh, started to do my job interviewing that spring, and uh, 
interviewed a number of places. Like uh, I remember one especially was Lawrence Radiation Lab, Lawrence Livermore Radiation Lab in California. Went out and interviewed five different groups. But they couldn't tell me what they were doing because everything was classified. Even though I had a Q clearance at the time working in the Ames lab, you had to have Q clearances. Uh, but they couldn't tell me what they were doing. And so uh, got back, well, all five groups wanted me. But I went back and I just, there's something about all the job interviews that I just wasn't happy with. And uh, that's the last thing I said earlier. The last thing I did not want to do was to teach. I wanted to work for research group. But the department head at the time was a man by the name of Dan Zafferano. At Lawrence Livermore? At, at Iowa State. Oh, at Iowa State, okay. And he was determined that at least one of the three of us who were graduating that year should go into teaching. Uh, well, two of us tried it. Uh, but I, was, I wasn't interested in it. But he asked me what I wanted to do, and I said I wanted to work with neutrons. Well, he said, okay, uh, you need a reactor, a nuclear reactor then. So he started listing all the places we had nuclear reactors on. Dan Zafferano at that time was also uh, head of the committee for the uh, National Science Foundation that granted money for research uh, for physics buildings. And so he had interviewed all the way around the country all these different physics departments, and he knew all the schools that had reactors. And he went down this place, no, you should be, no, you don't want that. MIT is where you should go. Well, okay. Uh, about uh, two or three weeks later, I had an offer to come to MIT to give a clothing. And so I went to MIT, gave him a clothing, and was offered a postdoc. So this was uh, 1963. I had a postdoc, one year postdoc at Iowa State. So I was 63, and then I went to MIT as a postdoc. So for about two years, and then stayed on now. as a faculty member for another five years. At MIT? At MIT. Okay. So I started off as assistant professor and promoted to associate professor. Oh, good. And then from there, is that when you came to Purdue? Then I wanted to come west. Okay. And I really thought, okay, I'll end up someplace, Los Alamos probably, kind of, well, that was always the place in my mind, my target place. Uh, but at MIT, I did have experience then in teaching. And, uh, that and was you got, you were associate prof? You got promoted? And I got finally up to associate prof, okay. yeah. I was in charge of teaching lab courses. Um, and so uh, that was interesting. And uh, anyway, I was planning to go to Los Alamos, or either that or Lawrence Livermore. But uh, a guy by the name of Alex Sosnowski contacted me from Purdue. He was acting head of, well, assistant head of the department, not acting head, but assistant head of the department. Phil Powers was the head at that time. But Phil Powers had an appointment at uh, Argonne and it took three or four days a week. And so he was only at Purdue about one day a week or so. So Sosanski was really running the, the program. And Sosanski asked me to interview here. So, okay, I came out and uh, offered a job and I accepted it. I thought, okay, it, it'll be good for a couple of years. Uh, one of the things that uh, attracted me to Purdue was a man by the name of Carl Ott who was interested in fast reactors. I had been doing work with fast reactor blankets at MIT. Uh, and so it, it uh, sounded good. And we had some ideas. <coughs> the ideas sounded interesting to me, so I thought, okay, I'll stop at Purdue. We'll, we'll try it here for a while and see how things work out. And uh, it worked out quite well. In about four or five years, we built the fast reactor blanket facility. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask about it, that was on my list. Can you tell us, yeah. tell us a little about that? But, uh, well, that was uh, designed, um, the whole idea behind that is we were interested in fast reactors, but our ability to do calculations in theory at that time was not all that great. We As it is today, probably. Compared to today, yes. Yeah. Uh, we had some theories that one could do calculations with, but uh, how good were they? And nobody really knew how good they were, and we had some real doubts about some of them. And so they needed some experimental data to verify whether or not the theory would work, or how good the theories were. So that was the idea behind the fast breeder blanket facility, to look at the neutron distribution and the neutrons in the blanket region of what would be a 
associated with the fast reactor. And uh, we got together here. Uh, there were a number of us. Jim Fulford was one who helped in the engineering of it. And then we built the fast rear blanket facility. And of course, we were looking around for it and where could we build it. Um, the physics had this big laboratory where they used to have a cyclotron that was removed during World War II. And uh, kind of a big empty room, which they were kind of used for storage. And uh, somehow we got off of that. How that ever happened, I don't know. You don't want to know. It just <laughs> occurred. It <laughs> happened, right? Yeah. Okay. It happened. And, yeah. Uh, and so we uh, got the lab uh, facility over there and we designed and built it. Where was stuff. the funding coming from? Did you get some government support? Oh, that was all go yeah, Atomic Energy Commission, the same deal we had for yeah. yeah, okay. Is it still, is still in operation? Not in operation. No, it's been shut down for, uh, we did the last research, uh, 1985, 86, oh, okay. something like that as well. But the equipment is still there, though? The equipment was still there. Uh, the facility is still there. They're in the process of moving it, dismantling it now. Moving it. Oh, okay. so the problem is that you have enriched uranium, and well, not, you, know, you have some low enriched uranium, but natural uranium and so forth. But, uh, a lot of it has to be very, you have to be very careful about security of it. And now we're getting ready, right. they're getting ready to move it out. Are they? Okay. I'm not involved with it anymore, thank goodness. Okay. Um, they have that nuclear reactor over there, don't they? Yes. Do they still have that? I was going to ask about that. Yeah, I didn't realize they came in 62. The reactor was built about 1963. They had the dedication in 1962. 63, 63. Yeah, right. Because yeah. I, it was some of the things I, they had a program, and yeah. that's why I picked up well, the date. Uh, that was, again, the early p uh, stages. Uh, Bob Bailey was one of the people who was involved with that heavily. Uh, Bob, of course, had left. But by the time in 1970, one of the reasons they recruited me is they really needed somebody to work with that reactor because they had nobody faculty members. They had one person out in Stansbury who did not have a degree in engineering, but who was a senior operator and was in charge of the reactor, but really did not know that much about it, sure. the theory of it. And they really had nobody else. So they had some other people and the faculty, but nobody experimentally oriented. And, um, so part of my responsibility would be to, take supervise, uh, to supervise the radiation labs, to go in. And, similar to the courses I was t uh, taught at MIT, began to teach radiation courses, instrumentation courses, uh, reactor courses. And uh, I'd worked with the reactor at MIT, although I did not operate it, uh, but I'd worked a bit with it, so it didn't take me long. I mean, uh, in six months I had my senior operator's license. Sure. And, uh, so do you have to uh, be certified as well? Is that until you need that? Yeah, do you have yeah, to get recertified uh, or not? You have to take, oh. be recertified, uh, I think, every three or four years. We have to oh. do, go back and take, the te take a test again. Yeah, well, probably those in those days tests. it was not online like they are today, and they really shake you up, you know. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, uh, we, had, we had to go through tests uh, sure. on a regular basis to be certified, yes. And it's still, we still have that on campus. So oh, yeah. Right. That's still here. Is it still used for, for research? It's still used, uh, not so much for research, it's more used for, as a teaching tool. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean, that's, the Purdue reactor was designed to be a 10, 10 kilowatt reactor, but it was uh, brought it up to one kilowatt, and it was licensed for that, and they've never, they never increased the free level for it. Uh, there were some reasons for it, primarily the radiation that would be involved with it. But the classroom's directly above it. Sure. But uh, the one kilowatt, you go up in the classroom because you can't see anything. All right. Yeah. Okay. So All right. <coughs> Let's move on to uh, when you're acting head and the challenges, the initiatives, and how you became the acting head. There was an opening, right? <laughs> uh, well, uh, Paul Lacoons wanted to step down. Uh, by this time, Phil Powers was head, uh, as I say, for two years. Uh, in 1982 or 83, then Paul Lacoons came in became head. Uh, they brought him in <coughs> from another, well, from Aero Engineering. Okay. And uh, Paul wanted to step down, so then we had to start a search committee. So uh, we had the search committee, but we were not having any luck. We couldn't agree on things. And uh, anyway, Paul stepped down, and uh, we needed an acting head, and some, somehow I got, I'd been a kind of an assistant head. But uh, I inherited the job more than anything else. Alex Dasowski was still here, but he was going to run to retire. 
and uh, there were some other faculty members who had been here longer than I had, but uh, I ended up with the job. Okay. What were some of the uh, challenges or anything you had looking for somebody during all that time, right? Well, for four years we had a search committee, and I spent a lot of time uh, going back through, uh, trying to give references, names of people who might be interested, who are good, uh, to then once we get a name, then who do I know that might know these people, or what could, what are their opinions of them? Through doing informal, uh, lots of time information like gathering, lots of information. I spent a lot of time on that, uh, and uh, we had at least one internal member of the faculty who wanted it, but the committee did not want him, and so he uh, often left. So that was part of the problem. We lost a faculty member then, so I had to also find some faculty. The faculty was not growing, uh, the number of faculty was not growing during the period of time. This was a period of time when uh, nuclear power was being downgraded because of the uh, effects of Three Mile Island or Chernobyl. Uh, the demand for uh, energy had kind of slacked off a bit. Uh, so nuclear power was kind of in a stagnant state at that point. How um, does that affect your enrollment? Did it, did it have some effect on? We, we managed to keep the enrollment pretty constant. In okay. fact, during my period of time, the graduate enrollment increased. Okay. We managed to do that. But uh, the overall enrollment was pretty stagnant. Uh, so we didn't have a need for more additional faculty members, but I did have to come up with a replacement. And uh, one of the people that first got brought in was uh, uh, left Terry Okay. Was the, um, uh, what about the careers during your, the acting time? What would the students be put, where were they, where were they and when they finished, did some go on for graduate work? Well, uh, the bachelor's degree people, uh, nuclear engineering was one of the areas where a master's degree really paid off. And so uh, we had a lot of our students, uh, certainly the students in the top half of the class were all qualified to do graduate work and uh, do master's degrees. And so we had a lot of students coming through for the master's program. Okay. Um, but part of my problem was uh, sometimes we had a couple faculty members who were very difficult to, with students and uh, doing a lot of uh, negotiating between students and faculty members. Uh, that takes. And, and uh, to have problems with some, so I had some problems with some faculty members. Sure. The dean at that time was Henry Yang. And Henry was a great dean, a strong supporter, and gave me all kinds of support. And I was really thankful for the support he gave me. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, we... Uh, I still hear, you know, I got to know some of the events, and so uh, every Christmas I send them a card, and I get a card back from both of them, oh, which is good. really nice. And it's always a picture of the campus of Santa Barbara, which I would love to see because I know yeah. it's, I've heard it's lovely out there. Yeah. So it's nice. Well, Henry Yang was, as I say, a great dean. I mean, some of the others that, that I've seen and so forth, I, I could work with some of them, but some don't. But Henry was and a, Dylan, I got to know. We uh, the day uh, either the uh, some of the engineering functions or something. We'd always chat a little bit, yeah. you know. And of course, when for the women in engineering, when they had that in, for Engineers Week, Henry would always have open houses for the seniors, you know. And, and yeah. she, of course, would be there. And I got so I got to know her. It was really they were ni nice couple. Yeah. 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 But anyway, uh, that was uh, as I say the challenge then was uh, find a new faculty member. Sure. Uh, negotiate between students and uh, faculty, uh, find faculty members, and look for a head. Yeah. And, and finally, uh, you got then you got you got some. Finally, found uh, Vic Ransom, uh, okay. who uh, came out of Oak Falls, and uh, she came in. All right. Okay. So I mean, you get her, not Idaho Falls, but Idaho National Laboratory. Oh, okay. Uh, this and the, the school has grown. That was one thing that, since over over the last number of years, hasn't it? Oh yes. It's, right. Uh, Nuclear Your facility is a little on the small side, again. though, isn't it? Our students were, were very well trained as engineers. Uh, unfortunately, during that period of time when I was acting in, we had a lot of good nuclear engineers, but the jobs were not there, and so a lot of them went to other areas. And uh, But they were, as I say, they had a strong background in math, uh, physics, uh, chemistry, some fair amount of chemistry. So they were qualified to do a lot of things. And a number of them, especially uh, after they got through a master's program, worked a lot with computers, and so a number of them ended up just going to those computers, sure. uh, programming and so forth. And so um, 
Now, in fact, I got an email the other day from one of my former students who had worked in the nuclear industry for about five or ten years, but the last 20 years have been all with computers. That's interesting, yeah, how it has changed over so, time. Then. Um, the uh, one of the grants that I saw that the new regulatory commission gave got this grant for 2.5 mil to that scaled down version of the General Electric proposed simplified boiling water thing. Do you remember that one? They said it was about 1993 to fund the development and construction of a scaled down model of General Electric's proposed simplified boiling Oops, water sorry. reactor. Vic Branson was the head at that time. I that's a, that's a big grant. I was involved a little bit with the Sure, that's a, that was a good sized grant. Oh, yeah. Particularly yeah. in that time. I mean, that's. Well, the FPBF grant would be just as large in its, in its value at the time. Yeah, I mean, sure. dollar amount, no, but value at the time, yes. <laughs> that's key. That's key, right. Let's talk a little bit about the hits, Paul Ikutis and then Dr. Ransom and then um, Arden Bennett. Um, then, then the others that came in. Then, of course, Ben Sprass was the interim head, and now is the current head, uh, Haim Hussein, is he new to the university or had he been here? He's new to the university. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure how long he's been here. Okay. I've been retired for 11 years now. Okay. So, so many new faces in the department, I hardly recognize many of them. Yeah. And uh, I recognize his face, but sure. I, not familiar with me. And they, they were, people recognize you, you're one, you know, you like you'll run into students and you're you're one out of but it's hard to put them all in place when you see them, you know, individually and they forget over time then. Uh, a little bit about the lecture series that you used to have in uh, nuclear engineering, in which you had okay. Glenn Seaborg. In those days, uh, this well, Paul Lacunas had become head uh -huh. and he was determined to build the department and, and make it better known. And one of his programs he started then was to uh, about every year or every other year to bring in one of these well-known speakers. And so uh, over the years, he brought in two uh, Nobel Prize winners and to give talks. Right. And so uh, it was nice to meet these people and get to know them a little bit. Uh, not that we had a chance to you know them very well. And uh, <laughs> most, of it, most of our association, my association at that time, was okay, we'd have dinner. And, and of course, the students get a, and, and it's the students, the students a get a chance to, to interact them. with them, and that, that's kind of key to it. So no, yeah. no, that was great. It was a great day. Do they still have their lecture series? Do you know? Uh, no, they don't. Okay. No, okay. okay. Even during Paul Lacuse's days, uh, as I say, after after Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, and the, in the late seventies, things started downhill, and uh, uh, Jimmy Carter come in as president, unfortunately, and he's was not a nuclear, he may have been trained as a nuclear engineer, but he was not in favor of nuclear power. And so things went downhill. <laughs> that, that started the downhill slide for, <laughs> right. for about 10, 15 uh, years. Uh, family, do you have, uh, tell us a little about your family. Okay, well, Jan and I were married in 58, uh, and uh, we had a son in 1960, okay. and a daughter in 1963. And uh, where are they located now? Well, our son is now a professor at the University of Richmond in, in Virginia. What's his discipline? Uh, unfortunately, it's not in engineering, it's accounting. <laughs> That's good. Somebody has to balance the books. <laughs> and uh, my daughter uh, got her bachelor's degree. Well, she went to a little college in Missouri called Cotted College for two years, then came to Purdue and spent almost four years here, three and a half years or sure. so, summer school. But she got her bachelor's degree in education. And she taught for a year in Fowler. Well, after she was married, she married a graduate student at Purdue. And uh, Rhode Island, Las Cruces, New Mexico. Does he work down there or is he? Well, she still teaches elementary school in, in a church school. Uh -huh. And uh, her husband is a professor of finance at the New Mexico State. Oh, very good. So That's kind of nice place to go in the winter. Uh, in the winter time, yes. I mean, they would like to have us move out there, but uh, in the summertime, I'm not interested. <laughs> <coughs> We've had the summer here this summer. It's been yes. really, really hot. Uh, awards and honors. Uh, you got the Charles B. Murphy Outstanding Undergrad Teaching Award. Yes. And also the Book of Great Teachers. And you're a fellow in the Teaching Academy. That's very nice. I think that plaque is wonderful, that Book oh, of Great I, Teachers. I, I, I just. That, Whenever my kids are here, they, they want to go to take a look and see that. It's stuff. wonderful. And I remember the picture that was in the, uh, one of the pa papers some years ago. The little grandson is pointing to, uh, you know, pointing to the name of some relative, and it was, it's just a little kid. It's just wonderful. And, it, and I remember 
uh, because Jim got in it too, and I remember when Dr. Ringel had the ceremony when they when the first time, and it was he did a really good uh, Ringel did a really good job with it. I just think it's I think it's wonderful. It really, I, is uh, nice. I, I was, that was one of the biggest honors. Yeah, I think so. And the Murphy Award, of course, was a great one too. Right. But, yeah, but, but uh, that's really kind of special. And two. the Kleinman Scholarship. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, that was a surprise. Okay. Uh, but it was uh, money which. Uh, some of our alums got together and uh, donated, and uh, was still there. Uh, not, not, not the million dollar one that Jim Barony got, but uh, it's still well, it sometimes it allows to for more than one. It, it just yeah. depends, you know. I mean, yeah. every no, it, it's, a, it's an endowed scholarship and uh, endowment fund, so it continues to to earn money, and uh, that's true. And it offers uh, one of the students who coming out of the freshman year to sophomore and. Uh, do you get to, uh, when they have the event, do you get to meet the student? I usually get to meet them, but uh, it's, recently it's been kind of merged with another program. Oh, so okay. They've changed a lot of some of that yeah. award thing, because you know the honors and awards, the convocation, they don't have that anymore. Yeah. Remember they used to have that in the spring, they discontinued that, so it's at the local level, I mean within the schools and whatever. Uh, professional associations, you still have the American Nuclear Society and... Well, okay, I'm a member of the American Nuclear Society and the American Physical Society. Both. Okay. At once, one thing I read, were you ever a member of the American Society of Engineering Education? Or not? Maybe years ago no. then. Okay. Um, how about a favorite Purdue tradition? Well, I guess if any of them, I like the, uh, we used to like the uh, Christmas programs. And that was uh, something special. And uh, we haven't gone recent years because of uh, the problems of where do you park and where do you, how far do you have to walk and so forth. If I had somebody deliver me uh, by bus right to the door, I think we'd be back for every year. <laughs> I'll, t I'll take that up as an extra job, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, how about outstanding event? Outstanding events in my life probably is getting married to my wife. Good. That's very nice. And retirement activities. Share with us what you've been up to. Well, uh... Did you take early... Did, you didn't take early no, I did not take early retirement. Did you, go, did you take the advantage of the halftime? I took advantage of the halftime retirement for three years. I waited until Jan was uh, 65 and, and to take Medicare. Sure. And so uh, then we, uh, we retired. And uh, so my activities a lot has been, uh, we attend a lot of elder hostels to travel around the country. Good. And, uh, Those are very nice. I know others have taken very advantage. good, yes. Right. Uh, it depends on what you want to do, but sure. uh, they're very good. But uh, I found I couldn't tell what day of the week it was. So I started doing some volunteer work. And a friend of mine, the former Purdue faculty, uh, was working at the courthouse in the prosecutor's office. And so he got me hooked into that job. And so uh, two days a week, I go into the prosecutor's office, the juvenile prosecutor's office. And I what sort of activities do you, are you involved in there? That's great. Well, it depends on it. Since I'm a volunteer, I can promote myself, so I'm office manager. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm a file clerk. <laughs> no, I, I, I pull the files and do, do, do the file work there. But it's a chance to meet some other people and uh, right. do something on a regular basis. And then uh, about two, two, two and a half months a year, I uh, do income taxes on a volunteer basis for the NRP group. And so I do usually two days a week. Uh, we do them down at the Jake's Rest uh, Senior Center in Lafayette. That's, that, that's what, uh, you know, Emily Mobley, who was our, our former dean, um, now lives in Texas, and she helps, uh, there are two things, she was helping the AARP with their taxes, but she also got involved, because she was on halftime before she finally retired, uh, with the GED program to help the students okay. pass, and she really, really, you know, enjoys that. And she liked working with the people on, on the taxes too. So that, it's a very, yeah. a, it's a great cause, and it's a really good thing to do. We all need a little help. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said, I took the courthouse job because I didn't want to work with people. Uh, but uh, when I got the AARP, that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> that's two different things, right? Two different <laughs> things, right? right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm going to leave the final things to you and anything that I forgot to ask. But I do want to put this because teaching was the last thing I was ever going to do in my life, but yes, I like teaching, I like seeing the students develop. Dr. Kleichman, I'll leave it to you. Something I forgot to ask? Oh, uh, that's exactly it. I mean, as I said, teaching was the last thing I ever was ever going to do when I got into it. Uh, actually, I did some teaching when I was an undergraduate. Um, 
One of the one of the societies I belonged to then was Tau Beta Pi, the National Engineering sure. Society. Sure. And uh, during the fall of my junior year, uh, well, uh, Tau Beta Pi used to teach a course in slide rule. How to how teach freshmen how to use a slide rule. I mean, people don't know what that is anymore, but that's. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, I. Uh, got roped into teaching that course in charge of that they teach That must have been an interesting course. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, it was a couple of days a week uh, sure. uh, for a few weeks. And, right. I'll teach them how to use slide rules. So I did a little bit of teaching. Of course, uh, even as an undergraduate, um, Montana State uh, had so few students as graduate students, they used undergraduates as teaching assistants in laboratories. And so uh, my sophomore year, I was a uh, lab assistant in the chemistry labs. And then the junior and senior year, I was a lab assistant in the physics labs. Right. Good experience. So I, I taught that. Good. And then at Iowa State, the first year, I was a teaching assistant, again, teaching labs. But, uh, so I had some experience in teaching. It uh, wasn't until I got to MIT where you placed in charge of a course. And uh, <laughs> You're it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're it. <laughs> but anyway, I found, yeah, it, it's fun teaching students and fun watching them develop. And, uh, and keeping in touch students. with them. Yeah, some not so good students. Right, and keeping in touch. Yeah. When you were through the university, did you serve on some other, any committees, particular, or just school, or were you ever in the Senate at all? I was in the University Senate for a number okay. of years, yes. Okay. And, uh, what committee did you serve on? Policy committee, or the resources, or? Not not so much the committee work. Oh, yeah. just the representative. Just the University Senate, yeah. Okay, that's always a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. That was uh, but that was there for I don't know, four or five years. Oh, okay. Right okay. Anything else that uh, you'd like to put in closing that uh, I've either forgot to ask? I'll leave it up to you. No, I think we pretty well covered it. Uh, it was interesting to do this because I had to go back and review a lot of my history, and I've been thinking about it the last couple of two or three days, and uh, trying to come up with some names okay. that people had forgotten. Anything that I forgot to ask? No. Do you think? Well, one thing, sure. Uh, one of the activities I've been doing, I haven't done it recently. I mean, it's since ninety, uh, since two thousand one. Starting in the mid eighties, I started to teach courses at Argonne National Lab. Um, Did you go over it, there and teach them? I would go there and teach them, and um, Argonne had teamed up with the International Atomic Energy Agency, and they would uh, teach courses. And one particular course was uh, nuclear instrumentation. Uh, and uh, these would be students, 15 to 20 students coming in from developing countries. Um, they would have some type of education, college education, but uh, they were trying to teach them to be able to maintain instrumentation, nuclear instrumentation. Uh, at that time in the 1980s, 1970s, the uh, government would give the, the uh, IEA and, and a lot of other governments would give to make donations to all these developing countries of very fancy equipment, uh, X-ray machines and, and, and all types of laboratory equipment and so forth. But they had no money to maintain it. And so I remember visiting some countries where we walk in and here would be the very fancy uh, radiation counter uh, measuring uh, uh, gamma rays just sitting there, been sitting there for five years. Nobody knew how to maintain it, how to fix it. And so uh, the program, I'm not sure just when it started, but uh, there was a man by the name of Jill Dolnachar who was in charge of it, and uh, teamed up with Argonne. And so anyway, they, they needed somebody to come in and teach for about two weeks to teach basic physics and the, how the various radiation detectors operated. Well, right down my line, and uh, they had a couple of other people who Jill was not happy with. But anyway, apparently was happy with me. And so uh, I taught one of these one course at Oregon. And uh, a little while later, I was invited to teach uh, two weeks of a course in Jamaica. And uh, the, the course moved around from place to place. And I came back to Oregon for three or four years. And I, we uh, went to Mexico one year. I was just outside of the uh, Mexico City in Toluca, Mexico. Um, great opportunities, that's wonderful. Oh yeah, great opportunities to go around and see different sure. parts. Uh, then there are a variety of other courses, there were about five or six other types of courses 
uh, offered at Argonne, which also involved somehow they needed some basic knowledge of nuclear physics and radiation detectors. Uh, so I'd get brought in for a couple of weeks, and um, and finally uh, the, they needed somebody to go to Sri Lanka. Uh, so that was a three-week assignment, but that was not teaching. That was just basically to help organize their laboratory, the laboratory, the laboratory at the university there, and uh, to see about maintaining the equipment. And were the uh, equipment, was that housed within the academia, within universities, or did well, most it vary? Of the most part it was uh, in academia, yes. Okay, okay. And, uh, but, uh, Rather than in a government uh, site. Well, when I was there in Sri Lanka, I know we went, uh, I was invited one afternoon, <coughs> one day, to visit with the, uh, what, via their Atomic Energy Commission, their, their, their uh, meet with their committee, and uh, they were asking me questions about nuclear power and so forth. And, uh, <coughs> and then uh, also, but I, in reviewing that, I mean, here was a beautiful uh, detector system just sitting there. Nobody knew how to maintain it. I mean, this would be, a, back in the 1950s and 1980s, this would be a $25,000, $30,000 piece of equipment just sitting there. And, uh, but anyway, in Sri Lanka, I met up with a uh, man who was in charge of the lab there that I worked with. Uh, Got a PhD from Texas A&M, and, &M, and uh, so we enjoyed it. And, uh, then uh, later on, I uh, went to Ghana to uh, teach a course, uh, again part of the, this instrumentation course. Could that you take your family with you? No. Oh. Uh, usually, when I was on these trips, uh, I would be working. Well, they say you'd be on the lab for eight hours or so a day. Then I'd have to get all my lectures prepared. So sure. uh, weekends I had free, and so the, they would always be very careful about taking us around and doing things on weekends. But the rest of the time you were working, sure. working hard. And uh, but anyway, uh, after Ghana I got back, and uh, one of the things that Ghana had, the original lab was set up by the Soviet Union, but the Soviet Union has basically pulled everything out then. Uh, by the mid 80s, I mean, things had collapsed. But they also had a nuclear reactor, and uh, well, t teaching research reactor. And uh, anyway, about two or three years later, one of my former students here, who now worked for the uh, State Department, uh, contacted me and said, I understand you've been to Ghana. They had just discovered that Ghana had a nuclear reactor, and they were wondering about it. <laughs> And they were concerned about it. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, right? Yeah. So anyway, uh, and went back. They uh, wanted me. Uh, God and needed some people to, uh, again, like so many people working in the in nuclear industry, uh, they were mature and uh, retiring and dying, and uh, they needed somebody to come sure. in some young people. So um, they asked me uh, if I would go out to Ghana, back to Ghana, and teach a course in basic nuclear physics, or reactor physics. So. I jammed my courses that would have been uh, in uh, about a semester and a half here into one month. And went over there. Went over there, yeah. Yeah. Was it pretty safe over there at that time? Or? Oh, yeah. Ghana was, uh, Ghana, is, is, if you had to go to Africa, it's one of the three countries I would say is safe. Okay. okay. Yeah. But, uh, it was very good. Uh, the first time I was on it, as I say, the site of the Southern National Laboratory, so it was all secure. That was where the reactor was. The second time there, the uh, the housing on the on the site was already taken, so I had to stay in a about a four three star hotel, two star hotel. <laughs> oh, that's hard. To yeah, do. that was tough. It was fun, <laughs> yeah. but I got to see uh, more of the. I had to go out walking in the neighborhood. And, you know, I felt safe there. Yeah, sure, but, uh, that's good. Those are wonderful opportunities. Yeah. Well, I would have continued to do it. Uh, in fact, in 19, 2001, I was scheduled to go as part of a team to go back to Africa to visit three or four different countries to review their programs for the International Atomic Energy Agency. But then 9-11 came along, and that just canceled everything. Yeah. And by that time, uh, Jan was not feeling too, doing so well, so I basically cut out a lot of my long trips. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, sounds good. Dr. Kleichman, I want to thank you very much well. for this opportunity. Very I'm, 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 it's been interesting, as I say. It, My pleasure. You, you,